Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Ryan, and I'm going to talk about the work I've been doing uh, investigating the potential for large-scale CO2 sequestration in shale gas formations. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is make it clear what we're talking about here. So just an illustration of a typical shale gas well with a horizontal lateral and hydraulic fractures. So during natural gas production, gas is flowing into the hydraulic fractures and then into the well. And we're looking at after the well is depleted of natural gas, pumping CO2 back into the well where it flows into the fractures and then out into the shale reservoir matrix. So there's uh, several characteristics of gas shales that led to the suggestion uh, of their use for CO2 sequestration. These include the fact that they strongly absorb CO2 and in fact much more strongly than the methane that was originally in place. Uh, there's a large accessible pore space through all the wells that have been drilled in the unconventional boom. Uh, these wells have been hydraulically fractured so they have enhanced injectivity and there's also the potential that uh, enhanced methane production may be realised from the injection of the CO2. Several studies have estimated the capacity that might be available in these shales, um, and some of the estimates include 10 to 18 gigatons in the Marcella shale by 2030, 55 gigatons in the Marcella shale in total, uh, and 28 gigatons in the Devonian shales under Kentucky. To put these numbers into context, US fixed point emissions are about 3.4 gigatons per year, so these estimates do represent very large capacities uh, where, if they could all be captured, uh, all US emissions for a number of years, decades, could be stored. So the objective with this work is to build a well-scale model uh, that can, inject, uh, can represent the injection dynamics to investigate the feasibility of injecting CO2 into shale wells for sequestration. We want to keep this model relatively simple. It's a feasibility type study while incorporating the most important physical process, processes the flow and transport of methane and CO2 and the absorption of methane and CO2 and their competition for absorption sites in the rock. So the basis for our modelling method, we heard a lot about, just two talks about, is from Tad Patsek and Frank Marley and Mark Mortar. Um, so you recognise some of the figures and the terminology here. Uh, but the result basically is that uh, Production data from shale gas wells fits very well to the solution of one-dimensional diffusion in a finite domain. So we're going to use that to, to represent our model of a horizontal shale well as a series of vertical hydraulic fracture planes along a horizontal well with one-dimensional, one-phase diffusion between the hydraulic fractures. So we want to extend this to a two-component model so we can represent both the CO2 gas and the methane gas. And our model is a system of two coupled equations, a pressure equation and a CO2 transport equation. Uh, the pressure equation is a nonlinear diffusion equation with a Darcy diffusive flux and a mass accumulation term including the bulk gas density and the absorbed densities of both CO2 and methane. For the bulk gas density, we use a Peng-Robertson equation of state to calculate the density. And for the absorbed densities, we use a multi-component Langmuir isotherm that's modified to represent excess adsorption. So the concept of excess adsorption accounts for the fact that in porous media with very small pores, such as these gas shales, the adsorbed phase occupies a significant fraction of that pore space. So you need to take that into account when calculating the total amount of mass in the domain. So to calibrate our model, we use natural gas production data from shale, from shale gas wells in the United States to fit the reservoir parameters. Uh, we chose two shale players to do this for. One's the Barnett Shale, which has the longest production history with which to match. It was where the shale boom began. And the second is the Marcella Shale, which, has, which is the largest play with the largest potential CO2 sequestration capacity and also a number of coal plants overlying it in Appalachia. For Barnett Shale, we used 9,000 wells of data. Uh, and for the Marcella Shale, we split, uh, split into two, two different regions that we analysed. Uh, the southwest Pennsylvania, where we had about 1,200 wells, 
and northeast Pennsylvania where there were 2,400 wells. Sorry, wrong direction. This map of the Marcellus Shale thickness shows why we split the Marcellus into two regions. And that's basically that in the northeast of Pennsylvania, the Marcellus is much thicker than in the southwest, and consequently the wells are much more productive in the northeast. To fit our model, as we heard in two talks before, we were fitting two groups of fitting parameters. The interference time, which basically uh, controls how quickly the gas can flow in or out, and the total mass term, or the gas in place term, uh, which decides how large our reservoir is and how much gas we could store in a well. So the graph here shows uh, production rate versus time for a typical average sh shale, uh, Barnett shale well. Um, and it can be seen that the model fits quite well to average production data from the Barnett shale. This graph now shows cumulative production with time. And this is now for the Marcellus shale southwest region. Um, and again, there's a quite a good fit with the production data. And we've chosen to fit the upper curves here because they represent more recently, well, uh, more recently drilled wells, which are longer than the older wells below. So with the fitted reservoir parameters, we used our two component model to simulate the injection of CO2 into a typical average well in the three different regions that we've analysed. Um, so this graph shows CO2 injection rate with time for a typical well from each of these three plays. And we can see, firstly, that injection rates decline rapidly with time early before declining more gradually at a later time. And that the Marcellus Northeast Pennsylvania has the highest injection rates and the Barnett Shale has the lowest injection rates. To put these numbers in context, uh, a typical large coal-fired power plant emits about 10,000 tonnes per day, compared with numbers in the 100 to 200 range here, down to 50. Um, so it's clear that a number of shale wells will be required to inject the emissions from a coal-fired power plant, and also that we would need to continually bring online new wells to account for the fact that individual wells' injection rates are declining rapidly. This now shows, again, uh, the model results, but now cumulative injected mass with time, for a typical well in each of the three formations. And the Marcellus in northeast Pennsylvania has the highest potential capacity of about 0.6 megatons over 40 years. Again, to put these numbers into context, uh, a typical large power coal power plant will emit about four megatons a year. To think about some of the implications of these results, we've done a spatial analysis of CO2 sequestration capacity in the Marcellus Shale in Pennsylvania. So the blue dots here represent Marcellus Shale wells, um, and that represents both existing wells and permitted wells. Permitted wells are wells that have been approved but have not yet been drilled and come into production. If we apply our average total capacities that we ca calculated using the model, the total capacity for all these wells is about 7 to 10 gigatons, which is less than the previous estimates I showed. Uh, okay. And so these red dots now, the red triangles, are stationary CO2 sources in Pennsylvania scaled for their emissions per year. And one thing that stands out is that in the most prospective region of northeast Pennsylvania, where we have the highest density of wells and the most productive wells, and the wells that we could put the most CO2 into per well, there are no large CO2 sources. Next, we had decided to look at these five large coal-fired power plants in southwest Pennsylvania and analyse how many wells we'd need to uh, sequester the emissions from those wells. So if we think that 40, if we assume that 40 years might be a re realistic time frame for sequestration and select the closest wells to those power plants, we need about 6,400 wells that cover about half of the state of Pennsylvania. If instead we decide that perhaps we want to pipe CO2 to the most pr prospective region in northeast Pennsylvania, 
we'd need significantly fewer wells and also in a significantly smaller area. Something to think about here is that if we're going to decide to, that we need to pipe CO2 hundreds of kilometres in the Marcella Shale, you'd probably also want to consider more conventional formations to the west where perhaps only a handful, tens maybe, of wells would be required uh, rather than thousands of wells. So some challenges and opportunities that uh, these results bring are that although capacity might be large in shale gas plays in the Marcellus, it would be practically difficult to utilise all this capacity. We'd need very large distribution networks that would need con continuous augmentation to bring new wells online. However, possibly shale wells are well suited or better suited for smaller scale, more local sequestration from smaller sources that might only need uh, handfuls of wells in their local area. Also, none of this discounts the possibility that enhanced methane recovery may be a possibility using CO2 injection, which would provide an extra uh, incentive to inject into the wells. To wrap up with conclusions, we developed a model of a shale reservoir incorporating the most important physical processes for looking at CO2 injection. The model gives us some feasibility engineering estimates of sequestration uh, potential of shale reservoirs, including capacity, rates, and the number of wells that might be required. An initial analysis we performed for Pennsylvania shows that while overall capacity is large, it will be difficult to access all of this capacity. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators, uh, data and funding sources, and thanks very much for your attention. And if we have time, I'll take some questions. No, we haven't looked at that uh, yet, but that's definitely something we're, we're going to look into in the future. Um, I think a big part of that will also be whether it turns out that you can realise any enhanced production from injecting the CO2. That might be a big, big factor in that. Yeah, so that, that definitely could be an issue and I know that similar work that's looked at uh, CO2 sequestration in coals, for example, has found big problems with that. Um, I know there has been some perhaps initial work on shales but there's kind of no uh, conclusive data I think yet so that's not something we've taken into account. Um, but one thing certainly is that it's the, it was thought that the organic matter is really where the, the adsorption takes place most of the absorption takes place um, and in shales we're looking at perhaps 5 to 10 percent organic matter compared to coals where it's 80, 90 percent and so I would expect that any effect would be less than coals but it, it could still be significant.